Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the episode 20 in the Global Webinar Series. My name is Dan Quigley. I'm the Director of Business Development and Marketing here at DSI. As always, I'm happy to be your host today. We have a special presenter this week, Dr. Vinod Kumar from Steel Authority of India Limited, or SAIL, is a longtime Global expert and resource for the Global community. Today, Dr. Kumar will be sharing a presentation titled Improving Steel Processing Through Thermal Mechanical Simulation Studies. But before Dr. Kumar takes over, I want to review a few points. Our goal, as always, will be to keep this webinar to one hour or less. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them using the chat feature here right in the webinar. Our team is available, our DSI team is available to answer some questions directly via the chat. And if time allows, we'll have a live Q&A with Dr. Kumar following the presentation. The video of this presentation will be available online soon, and certificates will also be emailed to you if you are listening to this live. Yes. And I'll be able to find a link to this video, as well as videos of past webinars by going to our website, gleeble.com, and then clicking on the resources link in the top navigation bar. <clears throat> then click on webinars, and there you can view past webinars and sign up for future webinars. And we have a very interesting presentation scheduled for next week, Ricardo Buzelin from Graz University of Technology will present his work on flow localization studies in titanium alloys. You can read the full description of his presentation and sign up for next week's webinar on our website. But without further ado, I am excited to introduce today's presenter and my friend, Dr. Vinod Kumar. Dr. Kumar has been using the Gleeble for many years and is passionate about his research uh, that he and his team conducts every day. Today's presentation will discuss key applications, including continuous casting, hot rolling, and strip annealing. His presentation will include examples from both lab-based and production-based studies. And Dr. Kumar has an impressive list of awards, including the prestigious Metallurgist of the Year from the Indian Ministry of Steel in 2013. However, I'm sure he's most proud of the fact that he also won the Gleeble Photo Contest that DSI hosted back in 2012. So you know, I'm not sure which is more prestigious, the Metallurgist of the Year or the Google Photo Contest, but I'll let, I'll let you all decide. But Dr. Kumar, thank you for preparing this presentation, and more importantly, thank you for your years of support and contributions to the Google community. And I'll virtually hand this over to you, and you can take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan. It was a nice introduction. And then we're going to talk about how Yeah, on behalf, you know, Global users some friends across India, and my own job actually, I would like to thank yourself, DSI, you know, and your team, Dr. Kamir, Dr. Chen, Dr. This only a coincidence, this mistake is a problem that you have to do. And we are also going to get to know about the idea of the person. Dr. Kumar, I'm sorry to interrupt. It, it sounds like yeah, there's you have no back or something with your, your microphone. There's a lot of noise. Can you hear? Yep. Are you some, here now? Uh, okay, it's okay. There's some feedback or some maybe some background noise. No, it's not some level. There was some background noise. Okay. Can I go ahead? Yep, go ahead. Well, hopefully it works out. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So I'm going to talk about uh, improving steel processing through thermal mechanical simulation studies. And uh, when actually I'm going to cover enough examples from lab scale as well as the board. So the slides will be actually interesting. Before I begin, actually, I really want to 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 if you look at the uh, steel authority of India business scenario, and we are actually five integrated steel plant, three specialist steel plants, including stainless steel and uh, hydrolytic steel plants. We have ferrolab plant, tractor plant, several RNO mines, qualities, 
and a very vast network of marketing organizations. This marketing organization is not only selling and marketing products, but this is a very useful you know, feedback we are getting from them in terms of you know, application requirements, new kinds of skill requirement from various user groups, designers, builders, constructors, you know, various organizations. And that's a very, very you know, important input for all our planning, particularly in the product development area. Then all these units are actually supported by R&D Center for R&D Skill, where I'm sitting in. There is an engineering main center for engineering and technology and a management training institute which looks after you know, all the HRD of various experience to the authority. If you look at the broad area of research, actually it covers, you know, at R&D Center, we cover the entire gamut of processing, which actually goes into the steel making and R&D. Right? We're starting from your know, R&D beneficiaries and mines. Uh, we have got, uh, you know, uh, coal energy environment area, iron making, steel making, building, supported by auto mixing. And we saw converts into, you know, useful products, which I'm heading right now. I'm very fortunate to, you know, have several, you know, young and energetic guys along with, you know, very experienced people. At this point of time, let me, you know, care that uh, most of our, you know, research focus is actually towards supporting our own plants and units. And therefore, we have got two planners to work on. One on the lab scale, where we are actually dealing with the fundamental understanding, most of the things, and the laboratory skill development. But at the same time, we are also oh, actually to you know translate these laboratory information or theoretical academic information into some useful you know platform at the industrial scale. So we are very fortunate to you know be exposed to you know large number of industrial cross across several stakeholders that we can. And I'm also very thankful, you know, to many of my friends actually across the country and through whom I've learned, you know, about uh, this thermomagnetic simulation studies in various spheres of the you world. Know, now, uh, there are some of the products actually, just to show, you know, uh, we are developing a you know, number of products. This in all 50 types of products, some 500 days, more than 5,000 dialysis we are dealing with. And there are some of the applications, you know, starting from engineering, EMEs, autos, you know, defense, electrical. LPGs, alarm, industrial gas, construction, and so on and so forth. So almost we are covering the you know, entire gamut of you know, requirement. And therefore, there is a tagline for sale. There is a little bit of sale in everybody's diet. If you look at actually the facilities you know, that we have for all the product development activities, we have a vacuum melting furnace. We also have air industrial melting furnace. And very soon, we are going to add VAD and ESR also. We have a hot and cooling mill which can actually work in both hot and cold mode. We have all the major steps, you know, for characterization in terms of APACM, EVSD, TEM, all the mechanical steps. Then we have got, you know, sort of corrosion labs and all the electrical labs. We have got, you know, a couple of process simulators like hot process simulator for coating studies and of course the level that I'm going to talk about in detail. And this is just for you know product development activities, and similarly we have you know for other areas also. This is huge setup in our India. Oh, just from the you know archives, so I thought I would share you know, this 20 years back. People you know unloading and packing going on. Then there's a stuff that we have. Uh, at the beginning, actually we got 3500 C system with the hotter days, and this was a 10 ton uh, system you know in, in both you know tension and compression. But this was a 2 HS. Which just means uh, we have 2,000 millimeter power second stroke rate it can go. At that point, we also you know prepared all the necessary attachments that is required for all the steel processing you know, studies, including HT paneling, mill steel temperature measurement, thermal stepping simulation, low force jasper, HEGs, CCT, and of course you know other stuff that is all there. And later on, we added hot person, the scanning laser dilatometer. And IR parameter for compact less laser meter. I was fortunate to visit you know, a couple of times to DSI in the US. It's a very beautiful city, and there are pictures from there. And that formation is a 40 years or something. So, coming to the main topic of simulation, this everybody knows, and we always talk about what is simulation and how things can be done. But just for replication, uh, this is the replica of the exact reproduction of the real world situation on a smaller scale. We all are aware of it, but in most of the cases I find, you know, once interacting with the people, they say that they are doing a simulation study, but it turns out to be a testing. Okay? 
like we must clearly understand there is a difference between material testing and simulation. Once you know actually what is the importance of these two separately, then of course you can utilize this system in a much better way. So just a quick you know thought. What is the material testing actually? In case of material testing, we determine some material property. So like you know, high temperature, you know, tensile property, compressive property, space temperature, and so on so forth. And this always carried out as you know against a particular standard. And so the remain test condition remains same. The main purpose is this to ensure repeatability and then of course determine the material property. In this case, there is no requirement of the knowledge of the processing that is going on, you know, in producing those material, or there is no requirement of metallurgical principle of that dosing. And therefore, it turns out to be a mere characterization of a material. But once we talk about simulation studies, as the definition says, this carried out as per the process condition, which is varying in nature. The no process to process can be same, you know. Even the hot rolling is different at different places, even in different mill, even the same mill, it is different. Okay. And therefore, it has to deal with flexible conditions. There's no particular standard. It goes as per your own understanding of things like that, what we are looking for. And therefore, a very, very good and deep understanding of the processing that we are going to see that is must along with all the metallurgical principles, not as a metallurgical principle, the mechanism, all those things is lost. And once you really understand this thing, you will lead actually to innovative solutions. And this is what we are looking for you know, with the simulation studies. And once we talk about simulation studies, what are the requirements? Since there is a thermomechanical simulation studies we are talking about, so there are two parts. One is thermal, other is Once we talk about thermal, you know, we require a very fast and accurate heating system. Fast so that we can do building simulation, we can do you know, some high speed, you know, steep railing where the actually metal goes into the furnace, which is a fast rate in the beginning, and we can do Why accurate heating? Simply because you know, at faster pace, accuracy, you know, can suffer. And if I'm not got a very accurate heating system, also, you know, then you cannot achieve the same accuracy. Now, in this particular case, we are talking about plus minus one C, even at faster state. Similarly, the adequate cooling system. You know, suppose you want to do say accelerated cooling simulation or a step or or some heat treatment, you require you know, different kinds of cooling system that is required. Capability to exert tensile and compressive forces, of course, that is there, but this will deal with very, very slow standard like stress relaxation studies to very high rate like forging and hot steam and you know, casing stands uh, simulation. Whatever you have, you know, in thermal and mechanical hardware, but unless you have a very flexible process, then you will use. Because we have to reproduce the real world situation. Now, with this global system, you know, that you given us, you know, provisions. You can have some programming, which is a simple and a specific type of a situation where they can import all your parameters, particularly in terms of, you know, say, stress or load of force, or strain, as well as, you know, thermal, that is, you know, in terms of temperature on different axes, but they are, you know, synchronized. They are, and everything is on real time basis. There is a SDS software which exclusive works with the hot deformances here in the hot always, where we can select 50 number of deformances sequences. And each one can actually work in isolation, okay, one after other. If you are very commercial and you want to, you know, go for a very complex, you know, real world situation to simulate and program, then GSL comes to your, you know, hand. This is a global script language. So whatever we are doing in table or SDS, it actually converts to GSM, which actually controls and operates the system. So you have to have a you know, very good knowledge about GSM, and that gives a leverage actually to go for you know, complex situations. And of course, HEG is there for building simulation and CCT for you know, canvas class. Near this for uh, dilation and phase transfer in the study, CCT plot. This also requires very smooth transition from force to stroke. This is something we need for. Once you're hitting a material, and this material is actually kept within the grips and is sold by the source. If there is no sport transfer, if it is not under zero force control, once the you know hitting is taking place, then the expansion of the material and that you have to you know experience compressive force in the material, which will interfere with your results. And therefore, while hitting everything is done in zero force, and then while deformation which is converted to stroke, so there should be a smooth transition. Then flexibility in the test environment. This also is very important. For example, if you are doing say hot rolling, it can be done in air, 
Men i hvert fald ikke fast, så er det sådan, at der er en playback. I hvert fald ikke, at der er noget slags sms, at der er en bar, og der er en playback. Okay, så der skal vi have noget fleksibilitet i testen. Og alt, hvad du gør, hvad vi har talt om så so far, hvis du ikke er god til at gøre det, This was an accurate, you know, suppose high school deformation is going on, unless you are able to acquire those data. Everything is of no use, even if you have done, you know, very good testing and everything is okay. So this acquisition system is something very important because this actually gives the opportunity to analyze your data, post defy, post testing, and present those data. And put together all these characters which is required in the thermodynamic symbol is actually available in the global system. This we have, and we are in the control of DSI in the of this system, which has given us uh, you know, very, very large flexibility in simulating all the metallurgical process that we can think of. Today I'm talking about the same process, it can be true, you know, it is true by any other process, or even other you know, component application services in those other things. So these are global everywhere. I you know like this a uh, couple of things you know, about this system, particularly with the thermal, you know. Where it can generate a thermal gradient as per your wish. If you want to have a similar you know, welding, you need a very, very steep thermal gradient because you want to heat the material at the center of it. Similarly, for thermal casting, you want to you know, weld, go to the melting, it stays in the center so that we can hold the liquid metal in the first tube, okay, besides the crystal. On the other hand, if you are doing say hot inside or hot compression, those are things, it requires very, very fat thermal gradient. So this is the beauty of the system where we can actually promote these techniques. Similarly, unlike other furnaces where you know you can heat either in the linear or the double linear mode, here we can actually heat the material in any other person, you know, whatever way you are, this is actually taken from a special you know, material characterization program, which we successfully did. And you can generate any kind of thermocycling or you know, thermal profile that is needed, which are otherwise not possible. Now coming on to the actual you know, topic, that is the steam processing. What we are dealing with, actually being in product development here in the R&D Center, we are dealing with the same new steel product development. It may be a new LR system altogether, or we are also looking at the reduction in lying element so that we can bring down the cost of production and of course the new application of the things. Now another scenario is that yield improvement. Being you know, in a business house, it's not like a you know, lab, Scale the study. Once you are in a business, you always try to bring down the cost of production, and the yield improvement is one such option. There, you are looking at the reduction in rejections, plus subproduction increase in line speed. Simply, you know, if you increase the line speed, the production goes up, and your cost of production will come down. Reduction crossing time or reduction crossing state. For example, you know, if you are doing quenching and tempering to achieve certain properties, and if you can achieve the same set of properties in hot only, you can avoid some crossing state. Similarly, for casting followed by hot rolling, and if you can avoid this rating during hot rolling from you know plasma casting and direct rolling, that is another reduction in the processing step. And this actually, you know, based on the energy consumption as well as the product, cost of production. You always, you know, look for quality improvement. Suppose you are making a product today with certain product, you know, as per some spec, but you are always actually producing this beyond that spec. Okay, some 10%, 20% extra attributes. Now, if you keep on improving this attribute, and you know, one day you will actually fall in the one is a path that is a hard grade. And that kind of you know, quality improvement has to continually work. And therefore, you can continuously work on this quality improvement program as using the system. And of course, all this actually requires a deep understanding and the fundamental understanding in terms of what the is in softening behavior, flow stress, evolution, microstructure, precipitation, phase assumption, and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at the specialist still our new product development, everything starts from design and chemistry and design of processing parameters. Now, suppose you want to you know, achieve certain uh, properties like high step. It can be done in both ways. Either you can keep on increasing your line elements, like carbon, manganese, or micro anything, you know, or you can reduce the align element, but still you can achieve the same sort of properties by optimizing the processing parameter if you have a good understanding of the process. Okay? And therefore, this is something very important. If you have a very, very good understanding of crossing, you can actually cut down on the lying elements, and therefore you can bring down the cost of production. And this requires knowledge of granules casting, the hot rolling, post rolling, boiling, step heat treatment. 
And of course, this followed by Matthias that are going to qualify the Matthias and Berlin if it is fabrication. So once we're talking about this crossing parameter of my son, okay, there are certain issues actually we come at us, and we must understand that. Ah, oh, these are issues, you know. And I'm going to cover each one of them one by one. So I'm not you know going to read out this slide, it is already available in this slide. Now, coming on to the Carlos Cosmic Restorement, there are two key issues. One is a breakout, other is a surplus cracking. Now, if you look at the breakout of the Carlos Castle, they simply because you know the solidified cell, which is actually formed at the surface, is not able to, it is too thin and it is not able to actually support the liquid matter. Okay. It may be because of the inadequate heat removal, due to improper cooling, maybe less time for some radiation, due to high rate of metal withdrawal, they may say casting speed is high, or maybe delayed cell diffusion or some physical abnormality. Or the lower cell state. Any, you know, any cause can be there, but this actually leads to the breakout. And one test we do actually for this is middle state temperature measurement. This has been already talked about just for education purposes. What we do here, this simple tensile test, but at a very, very low cost, we have temperature something near melting. Okay, it is near melting, near instant temperature. In which material is not able to be assigned, even zero force. It is not exactly zero. What we do actually. We apply a uh, tensile force something like you know, 2 MPa, which is very, very low. And then we start hitting it at a faster rate in the window, say up to 1300 degrees centigrade. And from there, actually, it has to be hit at a slow pace uh, once you once, once pass it up to the, the point where the material is not able to be designed and then that 2 meter passing force and uh, material uh, breaks and the sample breaks. And that is the middle state temperature. Now, this temperature must lie within the mold so that otherwise it is lying away, and then it will not lead to you know successful casting and breakup will happen. Coming down to the tracking, surface tracking. Now, what happens? You know, once the liquid metal is poured into the mold, it goes through the solidification process of the surface and then it progresses towards inside. But the material is coming out, continuously it is moving, okay. The job is taking place, and therefore, what happens, you know, there is a thermal aspect. Stress. It's a, it's a very, very steep thermal you know, gradient across cross section. When the internal material is to liquid, whereas you know surface is getting solidified, and therefore thermal stress is there. Then it well, this also you know is getting stress from the ferrostatic flow because of the liquid pool of the material itself. Then the you know several rows are there. You know, if there is a misalignment over there, that will cause stress. And then there's a secondary cooling going on or the primary cooling going on. If suppose some nozzles are choked, in that case, there will be no variance in the cooling. It is not a proper cooling or uniform cooling throughout the cross section. That will also lead to you know, deformation and as well as you know, stress. Then it is going through the bending and then there is a bending and then the stemming is taking place. That is introducing a lot of stress in the material. Now, this material, you know, which is under casting, must be able to accommodate these stress. If it is not, then you are going to, it is bound to crack. Now, this accommodation is actually measured in terms of reduction in area, that is a hot difficulty. And if the temperature was hot difficulty, there are several trough actually it explains Okay, you started from zone one, and this divided into zones one, two, and three. Zone one is actually the liquid fill, okay, at the grain boundaries. What happens, you know, as the metal is starts solidifying, it gains the strength as well as the activity, it goes to the maximum. Okay, it is going to the maximum, then again it goes down. This simply happening because you know there's some to split out oxide oxygen and fibers. You know, this causes embrittle. And embrittle is nothing but you know, there is a reduction in the ductility even when the strength is coming down. Okay. Otherwise, this would be otherwise. Then now once the ductility is coming down, this again goes to a trough and again it improves simply because you know it has actually it started possibly to work beyond a critical size. And if these oxides, the substances, some are beyond a critical size, it is no more, no more effective and the difficulty improves. It goes to a maximum. Now there is a transformation, okay, from a style to productive fried, which causes to again the difficulty comes down. Now, what happens? There are different reasons actually how to take care of this activity. And zone one is not that important because this is dealing with a little metal, but in zone two, which actually, you know. Uh, somewhere close to the bending and bending. This is something very important in transverse casting operation. Now, once we talked about, say, oxygen sulfide oxide, you know, this precipitate, and we have to actually caution it. 
to take care of the hemp industry. It means you have to allow more and more time. But that is possible if it is done at slower standard, this slower casting is fit. It's not desirable in uh, you know uh, business house. And moreover, in case of slower standard, if you don't think the casting is fit by yourself, okay, they trust process. Maybe around from say one meter to one and a half meter to two meter. If there is a very very low variation between slow strain strain rate. Okay, so what is the other option? Holding. You cannot do holding. You know because this is a continuous process. Or the slow cooling. So this is the only option left is the slow cooling. All right. And that is a secondary cooling people actually take care of. Okay. To take care of this and little and at this stage. During zone three, it is just the reverse. Now it is the you know protected formation. And therefore, you know, high standard is actually helpful in lowering this. Now, this has been covered, but is it okay? Camera sourcing simulation is carried out using you know 10 by 120 millimeter intensity sample, and the only the central portion is hit and it goes to the melting stage. Since this is a liquid, a quartz tube is actually used to hold that liquid full of metal, and there is a slit over there to take care of the thermocouple attachment to the mantle. Metal is heated to very, can be heated at faster rate, say about 100 to 150 degrees lower than the metal point. This is the estimated one to start with. And then this is slowly heated up. It goes to the you know, melting stage. At this point, actually, you have to hold for a few seconds so that you know, everything is moisturized. And then you start cooling. During cooling, a bit of compressive force is applied to take care of any air entrapment is there. It has to come out. Otherwise, you will get lower reduction in air. Okay, the wild pulling, a bit of a small amount of compressive force is applied. Now, I'll take an example, you know, from the actual industry house. Uh, we are regularly making a rail steel at our Vilay steel plant. This is a paint carbon, 98 years rail or 128 years rail. Okay. But the thing is that uh, once there's a requirement for permeable at rails to improve corrosion resistance, because this rail was supposed to, you know, be placed around coastal region. Then there was a question whether you know additional probe is going to affect our customability. Okay. So we did this simulation. So to start with, actually, we did at 1.5, one and a half C per second in here, and you can see the fate, this red line. And we are actually got a very, very poor ductility, which is something like 45 percent only. Okay, in zone two. This is not desirable. How to improve it? Then from the wisdom that we just learned, actually, it's lower, you know, cooling rate is going to help. And we did it from 1.5, we actually brought it down to 0.5. Okay, we did it in there. Actually, it see, there is no improvement in the ductility or reduction in the area, but only the temperature of the really tough sip from lower temperature to the higher temperature. Then, what is the other option? Then, we did the same thing in vacuum, mild vacuum. There is something like you know, organic shrouding that is cutting off the supply once the liquid pool of material is coming from lead to the gold. Okay. And once we did it, actually there is a drastic improvement. Now from 45, it has gone to 65. And everything, the blue line you can see is beautiful. And this green one, actually you can see. It's like actually this point five, so this blue one, you can see there's a drastic improvement. And everything is okay. And today when the casting was done, I mean, there was no issue at all. But what we are doing actually, since it's less than one point of casting is there. Suppose you're dealing with some material, this has got a higher coefficient of thermal exposure. Okay, there will be a problem. What happens if you are dealing with say steel, coefficient of thermal exposure is around 13. Okay, with the, the expansion at even at 1300, 1400 is only 0.2 or 0.25. And if you look at the cross tube that we are using to hold the liquid metal, the internal diameter is only 10.25 for every 10 millimeter diameter. It means there is an allowable you know, expansion is only 0.25 millimeter. So if you are dealing with say SS 304 or 310, which has got a high enough capsule of thermal exposure, it will cross even beyond the internal diameter of the positive and it will be In that case, you have to actually lower, you know, either the diameter or you have to use, you know, different cross tube. Now coming to the hot rolling, these are the key issues actually we have to deal with. High rolling load, maybe air cracking, there's one issue we face sometimes. Then control of microstructure, because everything is you know, based on the microstructure, all the properties are depending on them. Then the variation in microstructure, this particularly true with the cross thickness, okay? and particularly so in uh, thick plate rolling. Then hard work to build it put together, you know, everything has to be controlled. Then microstructure, my friend, you know, Fulvia has already talked about, 
this for replacement purpose, this a care has to, one has to take care. Everything is start from the prior state brain size, that is particularly in the reheating condition. It's not only the prior, but this is a reheating condition in reheated state brain. There are, of course, some critical transformation are there, which actually decides, you know, rolling schedule design. There is a TNI, AR3, and VS. Regionalization will be, that is a, maybe SRX or DRX. We will talk about that. And the importance actually lies how much information has to be given about TNR and how much below TNR is very, very important, particularly in mitral and steering. Then how much accumulated steering there in the mitral and lower in the asteroid before transformation is derived, where this actually controls the grain defender and finally the cooling conditions. I'll actually start with the first solution before going, you know, how to finish it. This can be done in two ways. One, of course, you can, you know, if there is a phase source or there is a change in the physical dynamics, it can be lengthwise or crosswise. In level, actually, we are using diameter meter, this is crosswise. Uh, people can use lengthwise also, you know, wherever possible. And we can also use flow states. Because there is a change in flow states. Suppose, you know, from a spray to thread, there is a transfer. Flow states comes down because thread is in lower flow states. What we're doing, you know, dilation is this is already we talked about earlier by this different brand. But if you look at there is a point of caution here. Okay. If you are using say copper grip, there will be a steep thermal gradient. You can imagine like this type of a thermal gradient. There is something like you know, this 100 degrees over 5 millimeters. It means every millimeter there is a change of say about 20 millimeters, 20 degrees centigrade. It means placement of thermal placement of diameter is very, very extremely important. Here if there is a you know, this eyes is made. There's no you know automatic you know placement. It has to be done with the eyes as well. And if you are placing it, even if there is a variation of say half a millimeter or one millimeter, there will be a variation in 20 20 degrees centigrade in terms of you know transformation temperature. And therefore, I would suggest if you are going for say cooling grade of say one to say 10, 15, or 20 even, you can go for you know hard grips rather than using you know they said proper grips. This actually can just invest in thermal grip. So I try to avoid it. And most of the industrial processing that goes on, you know, is accelerated fully, even an accelerator oil is hardly about 15 to 20. Okay. You can use hot grips so that you know you have a flatter thermal gradient, even if there is a there is you know a wrong judgment in placing your dilator method, you will get correct results. Oh, there's the dilation plot, this is already we talked about. And you can also do is uh, isothermal transformation, and this actually shows the kinetics of transformation. Then the influence of the standard. Normally, what we do actually in dialysis, we find out the transformation temperature, but that is under low strain, low strain minded. And uh, that is actually only good for heat treatment. It is not true for you know, any industrial process where the environment is strain is there, okay? whether it's the hot tooling or hot forcing or extrusion or anything, you know. And therefore, we must understand the influence of strain on the air treatment, which are any other transformation. Whatever, if there is a strain in the material, transformation temperature goes up. It is simply because that also. The strain is accumulated in terms of defects in the material, which also acts as a nucleus of site for transition from us to ferrite. Okay? And therefore, it is easy to transform as the temperature goes up. And similarly, the cases with the state gray size also. We have to take care of these things. Which is not there in the dialysis instruments. So there is just one example actually. I did vary it, you know, the deformation temperature, say from 800, I actually, okay, there is from 1000 degrees to 800, I can see there is a shift from you know, lower temperature to the higher temperature, the right side. Then I was talking about the determinants of uh, transformation temperature through flow states, and you can see this from Tarsan, I have taken from Jonas' paper. And then you will see, once there is a transformation set of transformation from a state of derived, there is a drop in flow stress. And there's a point of deflection is AR3. And with this compared to here, this AR1. So this is just like your dialysis plot, but this in terms of flow stress. No requisite temperature, again, this is actually done through multi pass multi-formation test. Here in this case, we have used a you know, 0.1 standard each pass, then uh, the pain pass deformation. With the temperature difference at 25, this much we can actually. In the beginning, actually, what you can do, you can go for higher temperature intervals, say 50 degrees, and then bring it down closer and closer to arrive at the exact, you know, and the correct, you know, temperature. 
then you have to conclude your mean flow stress based on this you know, formula that is the integration of uh, the area under the curve or a strain range and divided by strain that gives the mean flow stress and if you plot it the point of depression is the tnr okay. but what is that again the empirical is not available in the nutrition but this is not always true it is a dynamic difference. it depends on your slight condition yeah, is the grain size or the strain condition or the integral strain that is and once you really want to do all this thing, then you have to do multiple TNR determination tests. Otherwise, of course, it gives you know some idea about the TNR temperature, even in one particular country. And probably if you're doing say hot volume, what I mean is you know, many times people have come up with the question what should be the strain rate for these you know tests. Now, this transformation temperature is normally occurring somewhere between you know roughing process and freezing process. Now, fencing process are done at a very, very high standard. Roughing process at a very, very slow standard. It is something like one to ten. And therefore, this low liquid is occurring somewhere close to that. In this way, standard should be close to around five to ten. Now, we can do a static liquidization in a couple of ways. There's a you know, twisted deformation, where we have to give one free deformation. This may be about 0 0.2, 0 0.25. Okay, just to initiate a liquidization. And after a in the past time, which can vary actually, it can be say one second, ten seconds, 100, 1000 seconds. Okay, in the logarithmic scale, and then another deformation with the same condition has to be important. And based on the drop in this y, so drop in this flow stress, actually, we can conclude the process. After. And you see, for low nerve still, something is very easy, it is going to compensate, now. but for highly digesting. This never goes to compose even after you know, 1000 seconds, it's roughly about 16 million. So we have to take care. So once you're doing say microstructural modeling, many times people you know over simplify these things and take it that uh, if you know above low registration temperature, everything is registered. This is not true. The registration never goes to compression. Okay, this is very, very difficult. And if it is highly alarming, this never goes to compression, you have to take care, and you will end up in this scale. We can also do sampling studies, you know, uh, static sampling studies through stress analysis. Now, this uh, you know, technique has been developed by Professor Gazelin from the University of Holden, wherein you have to deform the material under some kind of condition and then hold it at that particular condition you know, for some time. And you will see the drop in the stress with the passage of time. At 1000 degrees, you will see the stress drops within no time. But as the temperature drops, it is taking a lot of time to you know, relieve. And that shows. No, how oh, how is the condition for the software taking place in these conditions? Now, of course, you can do a lot of dynamic visualization. Particularly, I find this thing, you know, coming from the non-ferrous people, dealing with aluminium, titanium, you know, magnesium, and those type of things. But one kind of person, actually, based on this dynamic visualization, people go for, you know, this crossing map development. Now, in all this crossing map development, what we are doing, we are taking a strain rate, starting from say 10 to minus 3 to say 10 to the 2, okay? Uh, because they have to you know, select some five points for various variables. But none of the industrial processing goes at minus 3 or even 10 to minus 2 or even minus 1, okay? And therefore, and most of this dynamic installation actually occurs at a very slow standard at high temperature, okay? But they, this is not a big one. And most dynamic is in, this is our experience actually in steel crossing is enough. Unless you have a very, very heavy deformation in the roughing pass, or you are going for something like close to warp rolling, okay? A very low temperature rolling and accumulating a lot of strain in the material during the freezing stage, which requires very, very robust mill to take care of the rolling load that will go up. Now, coming on the reduction, you know, above TNR. Normally, as a thumb roll, we divide. You know, entire rolling operation in two parts. What is the roughing stage and what is the tracing stage? But I would say we have must divide it in three parts. Okay. What is the width making pass, the roughing pass, and the fencing process? When I'm talking about width making process, this is a common mistake, you know, people do. And I've experienced my own, you know, plant also. But I mean, suppose you are, you know, using a slab, okay, width a thousand millimeter, and then you want to produce a 12, 15 millimeter width play or you know, plant. There is a small reduction actually, okay, which goes in to make this way. And as an operator, actually, in the control people in the mill, what they do, they don't, they are not satisfied at all with one single pass, okay, to make this way. 
they will always go back to three process and if they divide it i think the amount of deformation amount of the, you know reduction is very very low there's something like two percent three percent sometimes you know five to seven percent this is something very very dangerous what i must we must understand that reek is licensed to take place okay a sudden grain size is required even if it's very very close grain size reek is licensed may not occur at all because it also requires some place aside to you know, reek is licensed therefore if you are beyond the critical size this may be you know you are having a process and therefore if you are going for very shallow reduction like 5% in the wet method what would happen actually this will be at the surface only it will never penetrate to the center now center is still hitting up grain size is going up it is going whatever grain size is there at the end it is still going up and you will end up with instead of refining you will end up with you know grain growth even after reduction okay and you may end up with some grains which may not be recrystallized at all even during the subsequent process unless you use very heavy reduction okay in subsequent to recrystallize and therefore we have to take care of this weight making process try to actually make it in this of three passes or four passes try to make it in a couple of passes first pass may be anything with shallow but one pass has to be heavy then we have said you know what is the amount of deformation and you will see something like 15% minimum is required to refine the grain so there is something very important so coming down to the deformation below tea you know, again if you look at this you know, or we did the same experiment we varied the amount of deformation okay if it is zero is then you can see it has fully transfers very very coarse grain and at the same way this is all in a cooling there is a normal cooling there is no accelerated cooling in these cases okay it ends up with say a circular structure a very nice model uh, with you know some amount of error at the grain only as the amount of steam goes up amount of volume flux and of it goes up as well as it goes to final okay final and final It means there is an influence of stream. Actually, I'm not only the you know, amount of volume or amount of volume fraction of fluid, but also the grain size. And therefore, using the same chemistry, okay, if there is a change in the volume schedule, somehow there will be large variation from say this one to this one, and there will be large variation from the volume to the grain size. And many of people actually this this is there, and people wonder why there is so much of variation. do i am you know, crossing in the same way there another study that we did already this time we showed it for you also this actually so you know pace of boiling okay if the pace of boiling is fast it means the temperature difference between the two successive processes is less the subject like here in this case it is standard okay the entire deformation is over sub 2000 degrees starting from 1450 we get beautiful equation for it here but as the progress you know It goes for higher and higher rate of rolling, and you know time allowed will be to the two passes less. You can see there is a work done to take place. Now it has gone to say up to 800 in this particular case, and you can see the elongated grain. But before I go to the you know some practical examples, let me see some practical issues actually that we have to take care. You know compression testing in two ways. There is the linear sort of compression, the plane stuff, and in all those cases, you know most of the people. But the two is they do actually compression testing and heat it. They will they take it to the deformation temperature, heat it, cool it for some time, and you know hydrolyze and carry out the deformation. You get beautiful plot. It can be you know done by the three degrees less or whatever you know work out it. But this is not the real case. In reality, actually we go for on cooling type of deformation, wherein actually you are going to high temperature, heat it for this, taking it out and going for deformation. Okay. And this actually causes change in the condition. Suppose there is, you know, if it is mild, it may not be, you know, much difference. But suppose there is some alloying element, this will be a solution, like nickel, magnesium, like steel, or you know, magnesium sulfide, and those sort of things, which has to be dissolved into the reacting condition. There will be variation actually in the property, in the behavior. Now in this case, suppose at this particular temperature, all reacting curve actually shows beautiful dynamic viscosity. But if it is done on one cooling. You can see on the recovery. Okay. Now, based on this, if I infer something, there will be you know mistake. So, what you have to you have to take precaution. You, know? you have to be cautious while doing such sort of test. Another point of caution is that once we are deforming this material, there is always a dead metal. Dead metal means there is no deformation at all. This is contact with the element okay? at the top and the bottom. 
And as it compresses more and more, this data will start pressing. It means you can get any useful material for your microstructure characters. Therefore, it is always said that what you do actually, you cannot go beyond the three millimeter of the final thickness. So coming to some practical challenges for the industry. Yeah, this was the laboratory actually. This I did actually once we were dealing with thick plate rolling and we were observing, you know, conservation to not in the center. And in many cases, actually it was splitting in two. In the, you know, as a commercial of thinking, uh, we really thought that it is because of hard and and it was having, you know, very really high minus of 1.5 with the lab of micro. Because of the hard and because of the segregation issues, actually, you know, everyone thought about you know, this transfer into modesty. But this will not necessarily be true. If you take this example you know, from the plane stream compression that we did, there is no strain, this is in contact with the animal, okay, zero strain. But in this case, the formation has become at the same rate, and it has been pulled at once per second, you know, very, very slow pull. And you can see the thing, these are not no transfer, there is no strain. But as the strain goes up, okay, then the center is experiencing the maximum strain, and you can see the beautiful liquid is right? And in the same center. And this exactly happens in the thick plate rolling. It is just reverse. Whatever is on the surface, whatever you are deforming. And there's a normal, you know, mistake people do in thick plate rolling is that entire deformation is actually divided into so many number of persons. And therefore, the amount of deformation may be very, very low. Okay? In many cases, many steps, many reduction process. And in that case, this reduction of the deformation is actually considering the surface. Okay. Whereas Center is not experiencing that amount of strain. And therefore, at the end of the story, the center will actually transform to this type of a structure, whereas the surface is transforming to this. And there will be huge variation across the case. And this must be another. So, coming to another example, this from low nickel stainless steel, you know, passing out of a stainless steel plant, there were two issues. One with the high rolling wood, and another is the high hardness they were experiencing. Well, let me tell you, no nickel stainless steel is a utensil grade stainless steel, and this is a variant of 88 grade nickel stainless steel. Now, what I was if you are adding 8% nickel, things are very beautiful you know, in terms of deformation, but the cost is very high, and a lot of people cannot afford to buy these utensils. This is very costly. And therefore, to bring down the cost of production, nickel was reduced to very, very low level to say about 1%, but still you have to make it. You know, oscillating. What we do, we add you know a lot of copper into it. But there is a limit in addition of copper also because it will come out as a precipitate. Okay, it cannot be added as a snag. And therefore, how to make it oscillating? We add a lot of nitrogen in it. and put together we mix it so complex that crossing becomes difficult. And they were actually experiencing this type you know issues. Once we started studying this thing. First thing, of course, the higher rolling load issue was that we did, you know, for the formation, universal compression, and then we found this our we don't plot, but it was not coming out anything, you know, from that. Then we replotted it in terms of compressor versus the mean cloisters. And then we found that there's a slow increase up to 1050, and beyond that, there's a steep increase. In this, if you want to take care of the rolling load issue, you have to finish the entire rolling operation, say, between 1150 to 1050. Is 100 degrees hardly. This is not possible to finish the entire you know, rolling operation within this. Then what to do? Then we did stress analysis, as I told you. And then we found out what is, you know, how much time is required actually to soften the material between the interface. And taking advantage of this, we actually redefined the entire thing. We actually changed the rolling gap, okay, as well as the rolling speed, the interpass time also. And then we could actually, you can see this type of variation which causes mill tripping many a times. Now it is almost smooth. But this is a good example, you know, the system of Here yeah, another example from say high boron steel. Normally we talk about boron in PPM level, but here I'm talking about say half a percent, one percent level. If you add boron to steel, actually, you know, there's a huge problem. So once we started in it, okay, because it was a beautiful. But once we heated it in the rated person and brought it down, actually, you can see the thing. Okay. Then, once somehow we started rolling in other cases by bringing down the, you know, the rating condition. This was the fit. Okay. In the beginning. Okay. It was actually, you know, touching into several pieces. 
Then we did all the you know SMS and stuff. And a global also we found another liquid metal is missing out. Metal is missing out. Hello. Yes. Then how to take care actually? Then once we started studying actually what is happening, we did the first also we study and found out that there is a formation of iron boride. This is a low metallic point phase, okay, and that is causing this type of a problem. Another problem is the you know hardening. Even at the slowest of you know pulling, you can see the transfer is actually there. But there's an issue. But after that, we did you know all the changes, necessary changes in the processing, and then we could successfully roll it and even form it to the hub. So, yes, another example. This is a nickel super alloy. Once we started, they were actually facing a lot of cracking okay, while extruding this material. The problem is that how to take care of it. Then, once we started doing, it was cracking on such southern conditions like you know, 20 per second and 10 per second standard. And we thought whether to lower the fading rate okay, and the strain rate, whether it can help. It didn't actually. And again, it was cracking. Then we increased the strain rate rather than and everything was open. Now, in this case, you can see there's a little thing. And from here, once it dropped actually in the deformation temperature, you know, it increased again, it uh, you know, cracked. It means there is a particular condition. Now, another precaution that we did, and you must mention out here, actually. In many cases, what happens, there is a transformation, there is a precipitation during heating itself. Okay, if that is happening, that will also cause embrittlement and that may also lead to cracking. So if this kind of a thing is happening, you must understand your you know, material, okay, whether there is any precipitation during heating or not. Okay? If that is happening, you have to actually hold it for some time at that point so that it coarsens. And if it coarsens, this is no more effective in causing it. And then you can take care of this. Thing. This also we applied in this particular case. And now things are very successful and this is going without any trouble. Here's another example from real estate. But the basic idea is that you know once we are making say 90 UTS rail, and in this case, whether we can use the same material and produce 110 UTS rail. It means 90 kg per millimeter square to 10 kg per millimeter square. Only option left is since there is no change in the alloy, the only option left is to refine the polite rail size, the polite you know, interlaminar spacing. This from the plant, this interlaminar spacing is 0.25 micron, and by deformation, we could actually bring it down to one ton. 0.08 okay, my turn. And if you convert this to uh, UTS level, there's something like 124. It means there is a huge possibility. Even the 110 UTS can be produced using the same chemistry. This is from the archives, you know, we have dealt with you know so many materials, not only the steel, the terminal, the radium, and so many other allies. And you can see this is beautiful. No, this is not the round actually, this is the elliptical. This because of the texture, right? You need actually insertion. This from the bi, you know, bimetallic compression testing is going on. You can see this are different techniques and these are different techniques. Now I'll come to the last part, that is a history for really take you know, a couple of examples. Again, this has been covered by you know these fellows. But I'll take two examples. What I also know in for ST rolling, we always start from cold rolling, cold rolling steam, which is highly you know work out and bomb, and we try to soften it, okay, because it has to be cold. Now it can be in two instances. Two parts. One is the partially requisitized one, this is for one particular application, and the fully requisitized this for another different application. I'll take one example from each of these. Now, this was the full out galvanized actually. This is a galvanized which is used for the rooftop, okay, where you know monkeys can run over and the people can walk through. And this actually requires a hardness level of 85 HRV minimum, okay, it is not also, it is a minimum, okay, because there is no further formula required. And these are all the hidden stuff. Okay, it goes through several heating zones, and we actually simulated this particular zone. Okay, and from there it goes to the galvanizing part. Once we simulated this, and we found out that if you are maintaining really temperature in that particular zone, 500 maximum, we can actually end up with the 85 HRP. Okay, minimum. This is a partially requisite. If you are going for hard temperature, actually this will reduce the one. You know, this hardness will drop. On the other hand, this example of a raw color steel plant, here the requirement is 65 HRV maximum. Because this is used for fabric purposes, you know, for you know, some containers and other things. 
Here, the basic issue of whether we can increase the line speed from the routine, you know, coming from 50 power 60 meter per minute to 70 or excess of yard. And if we can do that, okay, we, we can actually increase the yield and cost of production in Kenya. This is a huge benefit. But the problem is that if you're going for higher speed over a residence time at different zones will be less. It means leakage less in the or the softening will be less. Okay, and you may not end up this kind of problem is here. But we simulated, you can see, you know, there's a complex simulation process again. But once we did it, actually it found even a 70 meter person which is fully recognized because I am going to end up with the desired hardness. And in fact, we can go for even higher with the same result in laboratory scale we found out, but the plant is happy even with the 70 meter in the afternoon of this day. And there's a last example that I talked about of the problem with the low nuclear stimulus is high hardness. Again, we simulated the entire linear simulation of the strip really care line, and we found out the plant were actually operated at around 1000 degrees and the hardness level was something here. You know, whereas they wanted you know, below 100 HRD. They thought, you know, if you're doing at higher temperature, matter will be soft and they can end up with a soft material. But it was no, actually it was going up. Then we, once we did the simulation, we found out that it has to be brought down actually and it's not going up. Okay, at 975, around 975, there is a truck. And that helped the plant. Now they are putting around here and there's no issue with the case. Now with this, I come to the end of this presentation. At the end, I would only say that fuel is all in one process matter. And what is the solution for all your miseries and all your issues is a result of Thomas Kasky efficiency and power, particularly this kind of you know, is still process. But there's no for any other you know, process. And the inherent potential of you know, thermoviolence simulation can only be gainfully applied when it is primarily used for simulation studies rather than material testing, though it can be used for other Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. This is all for my side. Yes, thank you very much. This is great. Uh, and uh, so we're just about out of time, so we may have time for just a couple of questions. Uh, would you mind jumping back to slot, I think, page 18? This one? Uh, 18. 18. Yeah. Okay. So I, I believe this question relates to page 18. Yeah. But I'm not sure. So uh, the question was in stage three of the ductility curve, are the micro oh. micro alloying elements oh, playing? That is a compost casting simulation. Okay. There we go. Yes. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So it says in stage three of the ductility curve, are the micro alloying elements playing a role in reducing hot ductility? Okay, they can prosper it like vanadium nitride or carbon nitrides, they, uh, they can prosper it. The main issue is with the product of ferrite. Okay. The problem in a canvas casting we are dealing with zone two, okay, which is under maximum mistress and this is lying around, you know, bending and bending. Okay. And if somebody fully physical problem is zone three, they have to take you know other precaution. There is a higher standard will help. Great, thank you. Yeah. The next slide is slide forty-five. Forty-five. Okay. Yes. It says uh, the microstructure is banded at the lowest and at the highest strain, but not so at the intermediate strain. I guess actually that that's the question is. This is slide 45. Yes. Is the one? Yes, I believe so. Or maybe 40. It looks like 45, yes. Yeah, what's the question? It's saying, is the microstructure banded at the lowest and the highest strain, but not so at the intermediate strain? No, but I couldn't get there, actually. What is that real? Actually, this simply shows the amount of strain, actually, okay, on the transformer, on the microstructure. If it is zero strain, you will end up with coarse structure. And because of the coarse structure, this will lead to you know, a secular structure like granite and modicide with a small amount of protected ferrite. But, okay, this one. But if you're going for higher and higher strain, volume fraction of ferrite goes up and it also gets refined. Okay, so if you have more, if you have accumulated more strain in the astray, you will end up with this kind of, you know, fine ferrite grain size. Which is excellent for high strength as well as high toughness. But if you have mild strength, very well, low strength accumulator strength, you may end up like this one, 
or maybe this one, okay, who is having a circular structure as well as you know protein structure. Right? This is not good. Uh, you know, many times this may not end up with good toughness. Great. And one final question, and this is relating to both uniaxial and plain strain compression. Uh, okay. It's asking uh, for microstructural characterization in uniaxial and plain strain compression. Which area mm -hmm. of the sample should be characterized? Okay. Now, if you look at this one, okay, the, these under you know dead metal with the material which is in contact with the anvil, okay, there's a no use. If you have to say, you know, you study, you know, what is the influence of strain across thickness, of course, you can do that. But this is the central portion only one has to look at the micro, okay, this is the okay. central portion, okay, we have this is a dead metal, the central portion is the dead metal, okay, this is not going under any strain. Okay, great. And then plain strain. I don't know if you have a diagram you can share for plain strain. This one? Yeah, perfect. So is it the same thing? Is it section C or no. all of them? Yeah, you can see the variation actually. If it is zero strain, you can end up with this type of force, you know, modesty structure in the same material. And at the center where the strain is pretty high, you may end up with the you know, equiax right? Okay, so we cannot say, you know, if the modest side is formed only at the quenching, water quenching, it can form even you know, at the slowest of cooling rate. If you can increase your hardening voltage through a slight conditioning. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. So we are a couple of minutes long, and I appreciate everybody's patience. But uh, Dr. Kumar, thank you for this this great presentation. It was very informative, uh, and I also do want to thank our team in India, uh, Siyash, Bishan, Suresh at DTS. Uh, as well as the Indian community. They've, uh, we started this webinar series in India and expanded it from there. I think we had really great response from the, the global community there. So I do appreciate uh, their participation and uh, involvement. And so I, I will end this here. I do want to make a quick call out. If, if anybody does have a question about their global or how global can help them, uh, please do reach out to the DSI team. I think everybody has my contact information, uh, but certainly there's the uh, the user portal on our website that's again that's on the resources link and you can create an account there and create a ticket or a mm -hmm. service ticket or search the knowledge base so uh, please do reach out to me uh, if you'd like to connect with Dr. Kumar directly as well uh, you can do that uh, looks like his contact information is there but we're also able to make that connection yeah anybody anybody's having any query you know anytime they can actually reach to me by this email ID this already shown over here they can contact anytime okay very good. And, and, and there have been a few okay. questions. We didn't get time to, to answer them. We will follow up uh, either with uh, Dr. Kumar or our, our team here will we'll follow up. So we do appreciate those comments. So I'll close this webinar. I do appreciate everybody's attendance and uh, please do stay safe and healthy. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan and my entire team actually for you know, putting up this show. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mike.